Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Pater Podcast. I'm Tom Hannafin. He is Matt McGloin. Penn State is now 6-4 and four after a disappointing home loss to the Michigan Wolverines by a score of 21-7, to seven, an opportunity to upset the number six team at the time in the college football playoff rankings. Uh, it goes awry for a number of reasons. Matt and I are going to dive into... Uh, some of the play calling choices, some of the game management choices throughout the game. I think uh, Penn State fans know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, a very rough day for Sean Clifford, just kind of everything that it has unraveled for him in this season, really since the Iowa game. The Penn State defense did about as much as it possibly could um, and ultimately just didn't have enough uh, against what is a good Michigan team. Give them a lot of credit. And also, I wanted to dive into some specifics about head coach James Franklin by the numbers. So we have all that to get to, but Matt, you and I do have uh, another announcement in regards to a guest that we will have this Friday on the Pater podcast. It's one of your former teammates. Yeah, Mike Maudi be joining us, uh, you know, this week for the podcast for for our preview uh this week so really looking forward to that we'll catch up with mike see what he's been up to and you know it seems like people enjoyed you know the uh the, the alan robinson uh podcast this this hey, past Rob, week man. he was awesome so uh yeah yeah we'll, we'll 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 dive into uh you know some football talk with mike share some stories you know talk about that 2012 season so uh that'll be that'll be a special episode i'm looking forward to that uh, Marty is one of the most special players in the history of Penn State football, and you know exactly why. The 42 decal on the side of uh, players' helmets uh, to end the season. And we thought it was fitting considering this Saturday against Rutgers is senior day. So uh, a guy who made a huge impact his entire career, but especially his senior year. So Mike Marty coming up this Friday's episode. But right now it's time to dive into everything that happened in the Michigan game. As always, I want to thank you all for liking, commenting, subscribing, and turning on notifications notifications because we are back and better than ever with a new web interface for the start of the basketball season and more props odds and lines than ever before bet online remains your number one spot for all the basketball and football action this season head to the new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50 percent welcome bonus on your first deposit just use our promo code believe 50 to receive your bonus from basketball, football, baseball, the NHL, UFC, your favorite Vegas casino games, and especially boxing. By the way, how about last week? It was announced that former NFL running back Frank Gore and former NBA guard Darren Williams will be a part of the Jake Paul versus Tommy Fury Showtime pay-per-view card, which is happening on December 18th in Tampa. So, of course, where there is a fight, there will be odds to bet on and bet online has made Williams a healthy favorite for the pair's professional boxing debuts. You do not want to miss that. So don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite sports. The Pater Podcast is presented by Bet Online, where the game starts. Also, we want to say that Funk Brewing is the official craft beer partner of the Pater Podcast. They've been so good to us. They have sponsored Matt's charity golf tournament for a number of years. Um, I got to enjoy it with Matt in the cart as we were bounding around Northeast PA earlier this year. That was a lot of fun. I'm terrible at golf, but luckily having the Citrus IPA and the Silent Disco IPA churning through my veins it didn't make me better but it just made me happier so i had a good time but uh matt they've been good friends of yours for a long time yeah they they do a fantastic job they're great people um you know they, they run a fantastic brewery and i just got a couple of four packs of a uh, beer called cozy tom it's a cinnamon mm. plum tea ipa I, I can't wait to try it Who i would feel ever think like, of that combo that's awesome i i, I feel like it's going to be perfect for this cold weather like, uh, yeah, I'm excited to try it. So so thank you to Funk Brewing for all you do. Your your beer's fantastic. And if you're listening to us and if you haven't tried it yet, go check it out. I think you can find it at pretty much any local grocery store, right, Tom? Yes, uh, you can find Funk Brewing at your favorite beer distributor and grocery store. And considering this is the last Penn State home game of the season coming up this Saturday, all you tailgaters, now is a good opportunity to get in there. Uh, trust me, their fresh, funky flavors will satisfy your craft beer loving taste buds. For more information, visit funkbrewing.com to learn where and how you can get their fantastic products. Must be 21 years or older to purchase. 
please drink responsibly. Well, autumn is here and we could all use a stiff breeze. That's right. This episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. Guys, confidence can take you far in life. It can also help you in the bedroom, especially when it comes time to step up to the plate. That's where Blue Chew comes in. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable tablets and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. The process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part? It's all done online. So there's no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and especially no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the United States of America and prepared and shipped directly to your door in a discreet package. They always say first impression. They always say first impressions are important. Well, what about lasting impressions? So if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, Blue Chew can help. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code PAYDER at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com promo code PAYDER to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the PAYDER podcast. All right, Matt, let us dive into this game, which I called it disappointing just because... Once this game really got underway, Michigan looked like a very beatable team. And I think you and I both kind of felt that going into the week. Um, Michigan, despite their lofty ranking and what their record has been thus far this season, there were definitely gaps in in their game. Um, There was reason for positivity because Blake Corum was deemed inactive for the game. So all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, maybe the rushing attack is not going to be as potent as it has been all season for the Wolverines. But Ultimately, Michigan just essentially outlasts uh, Penn State. There's a lot of different aspects of this to dive into. Um, Let's start on the offensive side of the ball for Penn State. This was really uh, frustrating from the beginning. And uh, it was a lot of fourth down calls. And I think Penn State fans know what I'm talking about. Um, let's walk through those first two in the first quarter, and I think you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, are you referring to the fake punt and then the fake field goal, correct? Oh, yeah. No, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> well, going back to what you said about Michigan looking very beatable, Tom, Like I-, I thought everybody in the Big Ten has looked beatable at times this year. That includes Ohio State. True. Right. You know, so I-, I think that, and I think we talked about this last week on the podcast, I think that's one of the more frustrating things about this Penn State football season is that, it, you can chalk it up to what could have been, right? You you really can because they have every ounce of talent on both sides of the ball to be able to be right at the top of the Big Ten right now. And look, unfortunately, injuries, you know, not making the most of situations throughout games, maybe not making the best decisions throughout the course of the game has cost Penn State football games this year. And that's why they're six and four right now. Um, let me start with this real quick and then I'll get to those two plays. Early on, I actually liked what Mike Yurcich was doing with his offense. Like I thought the game plan was was pretty, pretty good early on. I thought he was keeping that Michigan defense on their toes. They were going a little tempo, fast pace type offense, no huddle. The ball was getting out of Sean Clifford's hands. Um, You were taking away that pass rush sometimes, right? Wide receiver screens were good for the most part. Um, But what became the issue, Tom, and we talked about this, like, You let 97 make a massive impact, three sacks, a hurry that led to an intentional grounding. Uh, David Ojabo had two sacks, right? Too many times that O-line was in one-on-one situations and obvious passing downs. And Michigan took full advantage that, like I said, they tried to go that tempo, which they had some success doing, right? But at the end of the day, you have to be able to stand in the pocket, throw the football downfield with time. He didn't have the the time. He didn't have the production to do so. I also don't think they they didn't find the tight ends. Um, enough in this game. So the fake punt, it, you know, when when the punt team ran out, Tom, I was thinking to myself, I'm like, I can't believe he's not going for this. Right, because it was on, what, roughly the 40-yard line of Michigan? Yeah. I was like, okay. It was, yeah, <laughs> it was right It was right in that, you know, yardage where, you know, whatever, he always goes where for Where he it. normally goes the for fake, it. Yes, 
the fake punt I thought was great, right? I was shocked. Um, it was a great call, but that should have been the end of it. That's it. There it is. You got it. You got one by them. Great job. So the fake field goal. All right. If you're going to go for it, just go for it. Right. There's, there's no need to do this whole show, this whole fake field goal trick type thing. Just, just go run a play, run your, your run your best two point conversion play in that situation. What is it? And Tom, a lot of times when you have a two point conversion play, it's something very good because a lot of times you don't get to use it. So it's something you've yeah, practiced I mean, over and over again. Penn State proved against Illinois. They don't have a good two-point play. They had nine overtimes to prove if they had it, and they don't. <laughs> Wait, very, you're, you're, it's very true. That's true. But he, here's the thing. You're, try, like you're asking your holder, who is a backup kicker, to make mm-hmm. a perfect throw on a knee. You're lucky he got the football there. Mm -hmm. And now you're thinking, all right, my field goal kicker is going to be able to outrun Michigan's starting secondary. Vincent Gray was there to make the play. Potential first round draft pick, Daxon Hill was there to make a play. Brad Hawkins was there. Like, even if it's a good throw, he's not outrunning those dudes to the pylon. Mm -hmm. And like, I I like, I kind of laugh for a second and. And whatever, it's not like they showed Franklin on the sideline and he was like complaining that the throw. Right. Was that like Stout's like back hip? And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, that that's that is nothing to even do with the play. That kid, like, you cannot ask that kid to make that play. To make hey, man, take the snap. Mm-hmm. We know, like, we know you're you know, one of the a great holder, whatever you know, one of the backup kickers, man. Take the snap, you're on a knee, but then throw a dime to a guy running the opposite direction. That's hard for quarterbacks to do sometimes. But I mean, it's just like even with all like stuff like that, Tom, like the stuff that happened throughout the course of the game as well, they still had a chance. They still had a chance to win this football game and and they didn't. So let me come back to the fourth and two. Franklin was asked about it after the game. And he said that, well, you guys have seen that we don't really do well in short yardage situations. So exactly the point that you were just making of like, hey, just line up and try and get it was kind of his reasoning for why he didn't do it. And you understand that. And then again, he came back to the execution of it, which it's like, it's a boneheaded choice. The decision to do it is silly. Jordan Stout is not going to win that foot race, as you mentioned. And then he's ticked off because the execution of the play didn't go accordingly. My first thing, and I tweeted it, and then you and I texted each other about it. Take the freaking points. Michigan is incrementally a better football team than you. You cannot afford to screw around against this team. It is not like facing the bottom half of the Big Ten or some of your non-conference opponents where you can get cute, get away with it, and still win by a touchdown, two touchdowns, three touchdowns, whatever. If Penn State gets that field goal, is it 9-7 going into halftime? Is the final 21 to 20? Does Penn State ultimately win the game? And then the the thing that drives me absolutely insane, and I understand that people are saying, oh, you want to get touchdowns. James Franklin has said, oh, you want to get touchdowns. No bleep, okay? You're not getting them. Take the freaking points. Very nice. Very, very nice. Here's, here's the thing too, though. Here, here's the thing too, though, Tom, like in that situation, you're moving the ball, you're driving, you're driving. It's early. You can make up for a failed fourth down attempt that mm-hmm. early in the game. So even if you go for, you know, if you, if you go for it and you don't get it, Michigan is bringing their offense out on the field at the minus one at the minus two. Sure. They still have to go 98, 99 yards against one of the best defenses in the nation. A defense that played fantastic throughout the course of that game, I thought, right? Um, it's just, yeah, it, it's it, it just didn't make much sense to me, Tom. And you know, it, it's it's to the point really, and I'm not gonna sit here and you know complain or you know continue to to criticize, but it's like at the, are, are we are we surprised at at this point in time? Mm-mm. 
No, no uh, for those for those of you wondering, uh, this season, <clears throat> Penn State is nine of twenty on uh, fourth down attempts. That is the th- uh, they're tied for the 39th most attempts in FBS, and they have a 45 percent uh, uh, success rate on fourth down. That is tied for 91st in FBS. So I am going to come back to those statistics because there's more on that front. Uh, Because to your point, this has been symptomatic of James Franklin's tenure as head coach. He believes in the analytics. He believes in being aggressive. It's something he echoed um, in the post-game press conference. It's something he talked about all week. It's kind of his mantra as a coach. And you understand that. and You appreciate that. and You want to be aggressive and you want to try and go win the big game. Um, This team under James Franklin, uh, for the most part, does not win the big game. So I'm going to put a pin in that for now. Uh, we'll come back to James Franklin and some numbers later on. Let's shift our focus to uh, Sean Clifford. Um, some of his numbers have been uh, disappointing, and I think it's because he's not 100%. As much as he, Franklin, whomever, can go in front of the media and be like, oh, I've never felt better. Uh, I'm 100% uh, recovered from the injury against Iowa. Well, that's not accurate. Um, he had a 53% completion percentage uh, in the game against Michigan since exiting the Iowa game. So in the games that followed, he is 104 of 176. That's a 59% completion percentage, uh, six to one touchdown to interception ratio. So you're happy that's not a bad um, ratio there. He is 59th among FBS quarterbacks in completion percentage overall this season with 62 Point seven, um, for comparison, and it's funny you and I have talked about this extensively. Like, oh well, if they start throwing the ball more, is that going to be troublesome? Do you just accept bad plays? Freaking Will Rogers at Mississippi State throws the ball about fifty times a game and has a seventy-five percent completion percentage. Is he the greatest quarterback in FBS? I don't think anybody's going to make that argument. But you got to start looking at Sean and be like, okay, you're not healthy. The offensive line is not protecting you. But now the, the, there's inaccuracy. There's problems hitting your receivers. And it's just it just doesn't seem like a, a, an issue that's going to get better before the season is over. What have you seen? Yeah, no, you, you, you're absolutely right, Tom. And I think it's just one of those things where it's a, he has to be dealing with the na- a nagging injury, something that he just cannot get over, right? And it's hard, and it's hard to do that, Tom, because when you have the injury, you're still practicing every single day. You're still throwing mm-hmm. every single day. You're Things still lifting. Yep. Things are continuing to go. So you're you're trying to fight through it. You're scratch, scratch, claw, and doing everything you can to try to prepare for the game on Saturday. You're dealing with something that is obviously affecting your performance and affecting the way that you play. It has to be frustrating for Sean Clifford because of the year he was having to be missing some throws, and making some of the decisions that he's been making out there, Tom. Um, you know, it, it definitely affects you mentally um, because you know there's certain throws that you can make with confidence. You also know that when you reach back to throw the football, that split second you think to yourself, I don't know if this is going to end up where I want it to end up, and it's because I have this injury. Right, those are those are thoughts that that happens, man, and uh, it is. It's extremely frustrating. You know, you, you stop playing with that confidence. You stop trusting what you're seeing because it almost becomes I, I have to just find a completion because this injury is really again it's preventing it's preventing me from doing what I'm capable of doing. I thought he ran the ball a little bit better than we've seen in weeks past. You know, I mean, look, dude. The, the, uh, there's no doubt he's one of the toughest players in the Big Ten, right? Hundred percent to be able to watch to be able to watch him every single week, go out there, play for four quarters, battle through injuries, and try to lead his team, man. But you know, it's 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 definitely sad to watch sometimes because I go back to even this team, what what could have been, you know, and even for Sean Clifford now, what could have been if he was able to stay healthy? Yeah, his fortieth start as the. Uh, uh, quarterback for Penn State, so obviously thirtieth, right? Thirtieth, thirtieth. Oh, I thought uh, what's his name, Sean McDonough at forty. What? Anyway, doesn't matter. Uh, he's a ton of experience, obviously, and he's 
listen, we all know what he is capable of. We've seen it um, at points this season. Like everybody's going to point towards the first 20 minutes of the Iowa game where the guy was just on fire. Um, now you're holding your breath and I- I'm sitting there saying, okay, the guy ran the ball 16 times for well, 16 yards. Granted, he got beat up by that defensive line. So that stuff is, is skewed a bit, but um, it, you hold your breath every time anybody's even in a, in an arm's reach. You know, it, it, it has to affect the play calling as well, because I mean, put yourself in Mike Yurcich's shoes, Tom, if you know the quarterback, and again, this is all speculation, right? We don't know mm-hmm. if, Sean's a hundred percent. We don't know if it's he's 50%, 70, 80%. We don't know. Um, but put yourself in Mike Yersich's position. Like if you know your quarterback is banged up, it's like I, I can't keep calling these deep routes, these deep throws downfield because my guy f- is physically not capable of standing in the pocket and taking hit after hit after hit that a healthy quarterback can do. Right. That that has to put him in a tough position. Um but again, that goes back to just what I was talking about, about the game plan early on. I thought it was pretty good, right? Getting the ball out of his hands, but you mm-hmm. can't you can't continue to live in that world because Michigan is too good. They adjusted to it, right? They took advantage of those one-on-one situations they had. They rallied to the ball. They made plays. They stopped it. So, yeah. And the, and the play calling was actually, um, I wasn't upset with anything that Yurcich was calling, uh, you know, at least first through third down for the first three quarters. Uh, getting the tempo involved really seemed to work. It was a thrill to see the rushing attack actually working. Um, outside of Jordan Stout losing 18 yards on his um, doomed fourth down attempt, um, Penn State had 111 yards rushing total on the day. Kevon Lee had 20 for 88. Um, John Lovett only had four carries for 17 yards. Noah Kane didn't even touch the ball in the rushing game. Kevon Lee, by the way, is the last 100-yard rusher that Penn State has had, and that hasn't happened since 2020. So you're seeing positivity. It seems like Lee is separating himself. Um, But again, an offensive line that is built for pass protection, but maybe finding a little bit of a groove in the running game. It's just like, all right, it's like whack-a-mole. When one thing is covered, the other one pops up, and it's just – it's extraordinarily frustrating. And then it just seemed like in the fourth quarter, especially when it was, it looked like Penn state had, you know, 17, 14 lead. And ultimately I'm like, okay, like they could close this thing out. Um, credit to Cade McNamara, Michigan just made the right play at the right time. And then, uh, the final fourth down point I, I want to make is the last one that we saw Jahan Dotson gets injured, comes off the field and your still sticks with the fade route on fourth and two, it's not even in the neighborhood of the receiver, and that's the last ditch effort for Penn State. You know that goes back to not having a plan versus cover zero. Um, you know, it's that's just, not good. <laughs> it's it's not it's not and that's not again that's not on Sean Clifford. That's not his fault, right? You know, it, it, it's I talk about it every week. I feel like Tom, it goes back to what you do in certain situations. Do you have a plan or don't you have a plan? Right, I got to be able to get out of this play. I have to be able to get out of this play. If you bring this coverage, here's what I'm doing. If you bring pressure, you bring cover zero. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to check to. Everybody needs to know what your plan is and what your answer is. The fade route in that situation is not it. Right? I mean, it's 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 just it's it's frustrating to watch sometimes. That's all mm-hmm. you know. And uh, because you look at like some moments in this game, like the touchdown throw to Warren. That's just a dude making a play. Yeah. You know what I'm saying, man? Like Ripped overcoming overcoming some bad calls, overcoming some bad decisions throughout the course of the game. And this guy just goes up and makes a play for a touchdown. The two-point attempt, a great back shoulder throw to Jihad Dotson. Perfect, dude. That's how you draw it up. You cannot cover that 10 out of 10 times. Sean Clifford, Jihad Dotson, back shoulder, complete it. That it's that easy sometimes, like 14 14, right? Seven and a half minutes left in the game, and then you go back to it. And then the next time you're down in the red zone, the, the red zone passing offense is, is brutal, right? Too many times I feel like, and I know I was just talking about it, but too many times I feel like you're relying on just hey, Jihad, just go win one on one, right? You've missed some protection issues, your running backs weren't great and their protection. They missed assignments, and that's when you had to settle for three points and made it 17-14, you know, with, with 5.50 left in the game. 
Mm-hmm. But it's just it's so hit and miss sometimes. There's there's so much inconsistency there. Um that, you know, they they just the whole year they haven't been able to get away from it. The frustrating thing is we've seen them be great and to see them yes. struggle is eternally frustrating. This is not a inherently untalented offense that just is not accomplishing anything. You would you would forgive that. You would understand that. This is just an entirely different beast. And by the way, to your credit, Jahan Dotson, like you said on our previous episode, he did get his numbers in terms of nine catches, 61 yards. Credit to Michigan. They were able to uh, stymie him. So uh, we're going to turn our attention to the Penn State defensive effort and some of the things that the Michigan offense uh, did well this past Saturday. And then I do want to dive into some James Franklin numbers and statistics here in a moment. But before that, all of us involved here in the Pater podcast want to let you know that we're proud supporters of FON, also known as the Penn State Dance Marathon. FON is a year-long effort dedicated to raising funds and awareness for its sole beneficiary, Four Diamonds at Penn State Health Children's Hospital. THON is the largest student-run philanthropy in the world, committed to enhancing the lives of children and families impacted by childhood cancer. Four Diamonds picks up where insurance leaves off to relieve financial stress and provide emotional support so that no family ever has to see a medical bill. Since 1973, THON has raised over $190 million in the fight against childhood cancer. To learn more about THON or to donate, Visit thon.org. That's T H O N dot O R G. It's all for the kids. Make a difference in the life of a child today. And on another personal note, we want to take this opportunity to put a spotlight on mental health with a new initiative called Tag Me In. Tag Me In is simply asking for people to tag in on the conversation and help strip away the stigma around mental health. Whether you're looking to lend support, you want to talk, you want to share, maybe you need some help. We want to invite you to join in on the conversation. We encourage you to make a video, if you'd like, post it on your social media channels and use hashtag tag me in and hashtag tag me in United. At the very least, we want to hear from you. You are not alone. Tag me in. Visit tagmeinunited.com to learn more. All right, you touched on it a little bit earlier on here, Matt. The Penn State defense continues to be the bright spot for the Nittany Lions overall. They have been uh, extraordinarily consistent this entire season. You knew they weren't going to give up a ton of points to Michigan. Uh, They had a very nice performance, uh, in my opinion, in regards to the rushing attack of Michigan, which came in averaging 237 yards on the ground. Um, Obviously, without Blake Corum in there, uh, that changed things a little bit. But Hassan Haskins... Still got 31 carries for 156 yards. Now, on paper, that's not great, but to hold them to 144 yards total uh, rushing on the day, that is an accomplishment against this Wolverines defense. It just, this Penn State defense, as I mentioned, just did not get the support in terms of points on the board. Um, The one thing that did jump off the screen is that it looked like the Penn State secondary for once had a rough day. What did you see in regards to what Cade McNamara was able to accomplish? No, I think it played out pretty much exactly the way we thought it was going to, Tom. Right? We talked about Cade McNamara not making mistakes, taking what you were going to give him, throwing the ball right underneath the coverage. Right? It's I can't tell you how hard it is for some quarterbacks to be patient and to just take what's right in front of you. Hey, I'm just going to play completion driven football. You want to give me the tight end route? I'll throw it. You want to give me the check down to the running back? I'll throw it. You want to give me the underneath stuff all day? I'll throw it. Cade McNamara constantly took those routes, the underneath routes, the check downs, let those guys make play for him. And guess what? Penn State did a great job of keeping everything in front of them, rallying to the football and making tackles. Mm -hmm. They did that. But when you're not scoring offensively, you're not doing a ton offensively, like eventually, Tom, that's going to get to you. And unfortunately for Penn State, it got to them at the wrong time. And I'm talking about the 47-yard touchdown route to, to, to Eric all at the end of the game after Haskins ripped off that 17-yard run to start the drive. Yeah. Um, so, I mean... I thought they I thought they managed Haskins well. That that kid's a great running back. He runs hard, he runs tough. He's he's very difficult to bring down. I thought they did a great job against him. I mean, but you can't like against Michigan at home, if you were to tell me Michigan's gonna score twenty one points, I'm thinking Penn State's probably has a chance to win. 
right? It wasn't what it, it's what the offense didn't do, right? For the most part, the defense did their job. Yeah. Um, offensively, Cade McNamara, it was funny you talk about his patience. Um, Dan Orlovsky of ESPN, who was calling the game with Sean McDonough, was extraordinarily complimentary of him and just saying, listen, he's an efficient quarterback. I think so many people want to see the big gaudy video game numbers and guys do electric things in terms of athletic ability. And that's just not his game, but he does exactly what they need him to do. Um, he picked the right opportunities, the touchdown in the first half, the slant right, uh, the post route, excuse me, right over the middle. Um, Tig Brown just, you know, he he got moved by Mac, Mac Mara's eyes and then Joey Porter Jr. who had a rough day uh, altogether. Um there's, there's plenty to build on here, but I don't know if this Penn State defense should be like, you know, despondent after this situation. That I think they honestly played exceptionally well. And the reason that you're going to have a chance to beat Rutgers and beat Michigan State is going to be the same exact thing. And now if you're Brent Pry and you're James Franklin, you're going back to the defense and be like, hey, boxer up off the canvas, another round. We got to go. No, you're right. And that's the thing. They, they, they know, look, you know what you have as a defense, right? You continue to do what you've been doing, right? You haven't, you haven't been the issue. You haven't been the problem. So there's no need for you to continue to try to change things or can try to do different things. You can tweak things here or there, right? New blitzes, new pressures, new disguises, things like that. But right. This defense has been the strength of this Penn State football team, Tom. Yeah, um, and the one thing that's been encouraging, and I was curious what you saw, is that uh, the defensive line. So Arnold Ibiketti had himself another fantastic day. He is, yep. um, it's tough because with P.J. Mustafer out, um, that argument between who's the best defensive lineman, uh, we can't really have it. Um, however, it's concerning that Ibiketti seems to be the only guy really making a difference on the defensive line in terms of consistent pressure. And it's something Penn state has struggled with um, throughout the season. Um, was there something that you saw differently? So a lot of different bodies rotating in there, which was encouraging. Uh, yeah, no, it was, it, it was great to see the pressure. I thought the pressure was good at times. You're right. Epiketti, man, is just, he's a beast and he shows up at the right moments. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. he looked towards late in the game. He gets pressure on second down. That sack fumble next on the third on third mm -hmm. down. Um, he just he has a good feeling of when it's time to take a chance, right? To make a move inside. You do you know what I'm saying? Like it's just mm -hmm. he has he just has a really good feel for the game. Um, he, I feel like he energizes that defense. Um, you know, he, he's been such a big part of what they've done defensively. Um, and he's really stepped up in the past few weeks with without Mustafer. Yeah, Ebiketti finishing the day with two sacks, um, seven tackles, which you don't often see from the defensive end spot, which yeah. is great. Um, other defensive stalwarts we were talking about, we have Mike Motti on the podcast on Friday, a tackling machine during his day. Um, Ellis Brooks, 16 tackles. The man's mm -hmm. everywhere. Him and Brandon Smith, where one goes, the other seems to go. Um, so there's, a, there's a lot of bright spots with this team and, and I guess hats off to Curtis Jacobs for catching the fake punt, <laughs> the pass from Jordan <laughs> Stout. Yeah. yeah, dude, I, again, going back to that, like, I, I'm like, he's running the punt team out. I'm shocked. He's not going for this. Then sure enough, he throws, uh, he throws the fake punt. You know, that makes me think of, uh, there was a moment in that game, uh, I'm trying to go back to remember it correctly now. It was the wheel route to love it on the right sideline. Mm, yes. What do, What are your thoughts on that? I, I They've tried to go to that a number of times throughout the season. Yeah. I love it's a really good receiver out of the backfield. So yeah. I love the idea. <laughs> yeah. It's just always I, a question I, of execution. I just saw, I guess, saw a lot of criticism about that. Like, yeah, he's got to catch it. That's a drop and things like that. Like that, like that is a tough play for a running back to make. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I know I know he's done some nice things out of the backfield and catching the football, but third and long, a situation like that wheel route over the shoulder right hand. Does he probably catch it? Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. But it, it's still a very, very difficult play to make. And the, the previous two plays where your where your problem was in that drive, it wasn't that third and long that, you know, could have been or should have been a completion time. Well, and, you know, better than anybody, it's very similar to a quarterback rolling out. Uh, either direction because you've got to you got to get your legs going one way your hips in another direction your shoulders the like there's a lot that goes into that so the 
uh, the running backs that are fluid enough and athletic enough to be able to get in position just to turn their head to see if the ball yeah. is coming. Um, that's special. So uh, it's been there. He's been open for it. He can catch the football. Um, it just didn't work out. So it's discouraging. Um, in terms of special teams, and then I do want to get to James Franklin. Uh, James Franklin was obviously pretty ticked off about the missed field goal in the second yeah. half by Jordan Stout. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of praise for Jordan Stout. Oh, his overall ability, he's pulling double, triple duty if you include kickoffs. Um, he's an excellent punter. He's arguably the best punter in the country. I believe he's up for it. It's the Ray guy. I think I always forget the name mm-hmm. of the award. He's up for the Ray guy. Um, and I said it uh, many weeks ago on this podcast. He's a great punter. He's not a great kicker. Uh, is that kind of just the circumstance? Like, do we just have to accept he's not the most accurate kicker? Yeah, he's just really inconsistent. Uh, you're right. Not very accurate. You know, he's got a fantastic leg on him, right? As we saw, what was he at a 50, 52 yarder? What was it? 52 yarder. Yeah. You're like, great. Yarder. That's awesome. <laughs> well, that's, and that's like, that's, what's crazy about, uh, Jordan Stout. And that's, what's crazy about this field goal unit for Penn state. Like when, when they run out for like a 45 or a 50 yarder, you're like, all right, they're probably going to make this, mm-hmm. but it's that mid range stuff that, you know, you're, you're kind of holding your breath. Every mm-hmm. time you run out on it, and that's that's what that the, all of that goes into play when these coaches make these decisions, right? These coordinators, these head coaches. It's like, all right, what's my third down call going to be? Well, my third down call is going to be this because I know we're going to go for it on fourth down because we're not going to kick the field goal. Going back to 2012, Tom, we like we dealt with so much of that with Bill O'Brien as a play caller. Like we knew we were playing with four downs because he's, he never wanted to kick the field goal. So once you cross midfield, it was like, all right, we got four downs here. So if it's third and if it's third and nine or third and ten, and I'm and I'm, I'm third and nine, third and ten, I'm playing quarterback. I'm like, all right, yeah, I'm gonna try to pick up the first down here. But guess what, Tom? If I mm-hmm. don't, I have no problem checking it down and getting six or seven, eight yards to get myself in fourth and manageable because I know we're going for it. Mm-hmm. So it's stuff like that. All that stuff goes in goes into play. Um, you know, but it's just at the end of the day, it just seems like there's like when you go for it a lot on fourth down it, it, and I don't like, I don't think coaches will ever admit it, but it just goes back at, back to a lack of trust right mm-hmm. in your field goal unit. I'm glad you talked about fourth down because that's part of the James Franklin by the numbers portion of this show that I want to talk. You about. said you had something. I was waiting for it. I went down the rabbit hole last night and uh, into this morning in regards to uh, James Franklin uh, as head coach at the FBS level. Uh, so I'm talking about Vanderbilt and Penn State. What, what is his fourth down uh, conversion percentage? How many attempts has he had? I went through all the, the years and the numbers, right? And I did reach out to our good friend, uh, Thomas Frank Hart, Blue White Illustrated, because these numbers aren't entirely um, – telling the the full story because naturally and you know this as you just explained there are instances where hey you're down by three touchdowns you're going for it on fourth down because of pride because you're not going to give up so there's lots of situations that come up like that during the course of a season but obviously situations when you're up three to nothing or it's zero zero and like there's less theoretically at stake um that some of these numbers might not necessarily tell the whole story so thomas frank carr and i are hoping to work together on that to maybe get some more information either for our listeners or maybe we'll dive into that on the Rutgers postgame show on Blue White Illustrated. But let's go back to James Franklin's time at Rutgers. I'm sorry, time at Rutgers, time at Vanderbilt. His final season, Rutgers, God, I cannot talk today. Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt. Yeah, it's all about Rutgers, Rutgers, Rutgers this Saturday, Tom. All right, I'll wake up. So in James Franklin's last season at Vanderbilt, their conversion percentage on fourth down was 78.6%, Matt. Second in FBS. Wow. Excellent. That's impressive. Awesome. That's impressive. Yeah, that's impressive. It's amazing. 22 of 28 on fourth down. That was tied for the 10th most attempts on fourth down in all of SB- FBS. Prior to that, the season before, 17 of 30, uh, tied for 12th in attempts. 42nd in percentage, 56.7. But his first season, 15 of 20, 75%. So the body of work for the Commodores looks pretty good, right? And if you're James Franklin coming to State College, you're like, this is what I do. 
this has worked for me. And who would argue with that? Okay. Since 2014 to now, the worst uh, fourth down conversion percentage that James Franklin's team has ever posted was, in fact, in his very first season, uh, 36.8%. That year it was 118th in FBS. Would you like to know what it is this year? 28. It is 45%. Tied 45. for 94. Oh, you said the worst. You said the FBS. worst. I was, I was yes. thinking it this was going to be worse. This season is the second worst he's ever had between his time at Vanderbilt at Penn State on fourth down. Now, I mentioned some of these statistics earlier. Um, the fewest amount of attempts he ever had uh, on fourth down at Penn State was in 2017, only attempted four to- 14 times. Um, his fewest successful uh, fourth down plays was seven in 2014. So obviously that was a rough season for a number of reasons. However, the last two years have been positive for him in that 2020 to 2021, 61% on uh, fourth down. Uh, Same thing for 2019 and 2020. In fact, last year, Penn State was tied for 25th in FBS in terms of overall attempts on fourth down. So it's Very confounding because the numbers are there to support some positivity, at least in the last uh, in the last six years. The number has been no lower than 50 percent since 2016 and 15. So he continues to actually have a decent number at this. Now, I want to talk to Thomas Frank Carr in terms of where this ranks uh, during that entire time span amongst all FBS teams. That is a gigantic graph of data that I just don't have. This is all courtesy of ESPN.com. So the frustration is that this year it's abysmal. It's one of the worst in college football. And I want to leave these numbers uh, with the most important one that everybody is looking at right now. And it really hit me in the face because it was very early in the broadcast versus Michigan. Uh, There was a lower third graphic for James Franklin as the game was getting going, and it had his record. His record is now at 66 and 32 as the head coach of the Nittany Lions. It's a college, right, Matt? Mm -hmm. That's a D plus. 67%. Yeah. Does that feel good? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I saw it too. I didn't know. I didn't really know what to think of it. Look, obviously, the past two years have been difficult for this Penn State football program. Um, we, bro- we broke it down a couple weeks ago with him, you know, compared to Paul Christ, Kirk Ferentz, Pat Fitzgerald, right? All similar, um, similar amount of wins um, and what they've, those guys have been able to do since, since 2014. Um, right, right. Franklin's the only one that has a big 10 title. The other mm-hmm. one's, have Big Ten championship appearances. Um, you know, Jim Arbaugh's uh, obviously, uh, it doesn't get the credit that he deserves, you know, and we, mm-hmm. we've talked about that before as well. So, um, yeah, it, it's look, the name continues to to pop up for the LSU job, the USC job. Who knows? The Florida job may even be open now at the end of the season, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, well, with all that's going on down staff. there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so who knows? Um, you know, but what I do know these, these next two weeks are going to be very interesting for Penn state football. And, uh, what is it? I feel like I read an article or I saw something where a lot of times, uh, like you try to, they try to fill jobs before December 15th, right? That early signing day Mm -hmm. for the recruiting process. So look, we're going to find out soon within a month, Tom, of what the future holds at Penn state. Um, it's going to be interesting. Oh, oh, it's going to be interesting Um, for anybody that's wondering. I guess we can all probably agree that Nick Saban is the greatest current FBS coach alive. Um, His winning percentage at Alabama is 80 percent and his (laughs) career average is, I think, 88 percent percent. And that's over a tremendous body of work. So I've said it before that. Penn State fans should be grateful for what they have because it's like the wins above replacement statistic in baseball where it's like, who are you going to get that's better? And a gap, that's still a pretty big gap between, let's say, Nick Saban is 80 and you've got uh, James Franklin at 67%. 13% is a lot. That's not just like, oh, marginal things that you've got to try and creep up on somebody. No, there's a gap. 
it's what it's what you do in big games tom that's all that matters right Mm -hmm. um and even more so now than ever before in college football right patience doesn't exist anymore you have to win you have to win now you have to get to your conference championship games you have to make a push for the playoff um that's all that matters that's what sells if you can't do it you know people people are going to want someone else Mm -hmm. Right. Unfortunately, college football, the NFL, whatever you want to look at it, it's all a production based business Mm -hmm. where you got to win. You have to play well. That's it, man. That's the name of the game. Here's the truth of the matter. This Saturday, Penn State hosts Rutgers for Senior Day, final home game of the season. That game is at noon Eastern on the Big Ten Network. Um Rutgers comes in five and five, Penn State six and four. So this is no longer looking down your nose at an opponent. We've said the entire season this is a beatable opponent. I don't know what to predict from this team week to week. So this I expect to be a game. Here's the truth of the matter, Matt. If Penn State loses this game to Rutgers, James Franklin is 500 between 2020 and 2021, obviously not including the outcome of the Michigan State game. Yeah, it's surprising. It is, um, you know, and it's you really. I, I mean, you really don't know what to say about it because, again, expectations are very high at Penn State, and they've been very high for James Franklin. In um, the past two years, they just haven't been able to, to deliver. Um, you know, obviously, last year was a tough year for everyone, um, but there's really no excuse for the record this year, and especially if they lose this Saturday. We're going to see what happens. So we hope you will all join us this Friday for a fresh edition of the podcast. We are going to preview Penn State versus Rutgers, as I mentioned, that is a noon kick this Saturday on Big Ten Network. And our guest will be Penn State linebacker legend Mike Maudie uh, to hopefully give us a little ray of sunshine in what has been a gloomy season and one of the greatest senior tributes we've ever seen for Mike Maudie. Uh, very fitting for this senior day uh, for Penn State. So thank you all for joining us, for liking, commenting, subscribing, and turning on notifications. And we'll see you Friday for another edition of Pay Dirt.